I'm Angela Prather. I'm Eunice Butts. And it's so nice to have the two of you together. You've, you've both served our country, slightly overlapping eras. Um, Eunice, what, when did you get into the service? I went into the service in January 1965. My God, that's the Vietnam era. That's correct. And, and, and were, you, uh, were you there in that theater? No. I was here in the United States, uh -huh. and uh, I worked in supply, I worked in uh, special war readiness material. I supplied the planes that were in Vietnam mm -hmm. when they broke down. Okay, and, and how about you, Angela? Um, I joined in July of 1982. Uh -huh. um, spent most of my time in the Asian theater, um, Subic Bay, the Philippines. Um, aboard the USS McKee, which was a submarine support tender, because when I was in, ladies could only go to sub-tenders and destroyer tenders and to overseas duty. We couldn't do anything else. <laughs> well, you know, this is a very interesting topic, and, and maybe we can touch on it a little bit. You know, what has it been like being a woman in the armed services? So. <laughs> <laughs> um, for the most part, um, it was amazing. I mean, I credit most of my success post-military um, to my military service. Mm -hmm. I think it. I think it, military people are some of the best employees in the world because of our attention to detail, mm -hmm. our commitment to chain of command, and our commitment to get a job done. And we just don't, you know, cut out at five o'clock, you know, because mm -hmm. day's over. Um, on the flip side, um, there was a lot of difficulty because back then and. Um, you know, I was the only woman in my unit for a long time because I went into a male-dominated field of engineering, and, and it kind of still dismays me that I'm talking to some of the ladies that served um, quite a bit after me, and I still hear some of the same things. So it's, it, it kind of saddens me in some ways that the military still has a really a long way to go in, in women serving and, and being aware of the different issues, and they're still not treated appropriately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you were in a little earlier. Did you find that to be the case, Eunice, of being a woman in the... Uh... Yes, I was a minority. And, and I minority. used to tease them. I said, I'm just a minority all the way around, aren't I? You see, that way that kept the guys off my case, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But I enjoyed it. And just as she said, I attribute my life today based on the discipline, teaching, and learning that I acquired. I was also fortunate to go to the United States Air Force Reserve on two missions. I was also a member of the Alabama Air National Guard, mm -hmm. and I got the opportunity to go back through the Air Force Reserve on active duty because they had critical career fields and they needed someone. Okay. There was a lot of negativism, but I knew my job. And since I knew my job, I wanted to stay positive, so I did things to stay positive, irregardless of the negativism that was around me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So after a while, they just thought I was crazy, <laughs> but I stayed happy. I kept them off of me. <laughs> wow. I'm just, you know, I'm happy about this conference, um, and it's interesting to hear other ladies from my era, or not too long after my era. We really go through a long period, all of us, of not self-identifying as veterans anymore. We kind of walk away from it and don't, and I really didn't start to. I've always been proud of my service, always, but I just didn't want to know. I just didn't want to deal with it, didn't want to know about it. I just didn't want people recognizing it. It really wasn't until my son joined the Marine Corps that I really began to re-identify as a veteran and, mm -hmm, and began mm -hmm. to step forward and say, okay, I, I am proud, recognize me, et cetera. But for a long time, I just didn't, you know, because of, you know, everything that, that went on and, and some of the treatment, I just was like, you know what, I don't care. But so, and since then, you know, I've become active in a number of organizations and, and really stepping back up to the plate because I think there's a need for us women who served back in Eunice's time and in my time to step forward so that these younger ladies don't have to go through as long of a process as we did and, and can be prouder sooner and okay sooner. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's like the military is almost like the last frontier. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. You know, we've seen women get in, you know, the office situations and, you know, construction trades and other things, and it's it's like the last bastion, and it's been the most, in a sense, rigid and uh, masculine kind of dominated thing, and and and. Um, do you, how, how, how much progress has been made? How much progress needs to be made? I, I think. still think a whole lot. I, you know, I'd like, I think in some ways a lot of progress has been made because when I served, I was, for as far as the United States Navy, I was limited to two kinds of ships and to overseas duty and a lot of billets were closed. I mean, in a little bit, I wanted to go into nuclear and gas turbine, but at the time I served, women were not allowed because we couldn't serve on aircraft carriers. Well, now, mm. at least as far as the United States Navy, minus a few fields, women are pretty much allowed to do anything. So I think in that way, they've made tremendous progress. But I think when it comes to assimilating the women into and teaching the men how to deal with them and what's appropriate and what's inappropriate, unfortunately, I still feel like we haven't gotten very far. You know, I feel like the last few years, the voices have gotten louder um, with what's been going on in Capitol Hill. but. Just now, because I still don't feel like in that sense of us being assimilated and accepted as an equal, we're not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what do you think? And I, I, I think that we have come a very, very long way. During my days, you were taught by the person that had a little more rank than you. Today, our military people are professionals. True. They have to go off to schools, go off to training, and so forth. I was just recently at one of the biggest bases here in Florida, and it was amazing on the tour that I took. So in that aspect, it is wonderful. But as she stated, there is still more room mm -hmm. as far as female veterans are concerned. This has even carried over into some of the predominant organizations in which I am a member of the American Legion, where I'm the central area commander for the state of Florida. A lot of females don't want to hear about me. They don't want other people in the community to know they've been in the military because of all of this hurt and the things that they went through. And it makes them hold their heads down. This is why I'm a member of the American Legion, because now I talk to them and try to get them to feel good about themselves. Mm. It is them that count and not the ones around us that's trying to bring us down. Uh, my lady's experience was a gentleman in the American Legion. We don't want no female. We're not going to have a female commander. And just before he died, six months before he died, he called and asked me, Eunice, would you please uh, be the commander of the post? I say, who, me? I'm a female. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I've experienced in, in the VFW and that still, and, and a bunch of, actually a bunch of us, after you talked to us, a bunch of us ladies were talking about it, and I said, I can't go in there. It's all the old, they, they don't want us there. They want us to service their food, and they want, and I always get pointed to the auxiliary down the hallway. I'm like, I don't belong there. So I think there's there is a, a stigmatism that's attached to American League. VW that a lot of us feel like or we've tried to go there and we feel like we're just you know not accepted it, it's it, they don't want us there you know are they they relegate us to the ladies room okay uh, what's happening you still have a lot of the older regime the younger people are not coming in or they are so few the older regime that's it when we reach a certain age that's it and that's what's happening but on the other hand, we as females will have to be strong and fight for what we want. I fought for what I wanted in my post, but I did it with a smile. Now I am well respected by all of them, whether they like me or not. <laughs> Respect is and more this important is, than somebody this, liking you. This, this, and, and, and this is what the rest have to do, but it's so hard and I understand where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. So I put a lot of time, I invest a lot of my time in female veterans, especially the homeless, the poor, and the destitute, and the others that 
need my help or anything I can do to assist them to come on this side of the world. Times have changed during my days. Okay, but I don't carry the baggage with me anymore. That's stressful. You know, and, in the, and in the public, I think there needs to be more recognition of women veterans. We don't want more than the guys are getting, but we want to be equal. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had ladies tell me a story that she's, she's a service disabled veteran served in Iraq and Afghanistan, and she was parking her car and she has disabled veterans plates, and they came up and were telling her she had to move. You can't park out if your husband's not here. She's like, excuse me, no, I'm, I'm a veteran. And I just think that we have, you know, so much, even, even the point that I'm with an organization out of Orlando, and we're doing a, we have our signature event, and we're doing an honoring World War II vets, because as you know, there's not going to be too many of them, there's too many left. And I go, well, why are there only got, you know, I go, why, I'm the volunteer director, I go, you only have men up here. So our two ladies, that the twin sisters, I went up and I said, I would love you ladies to come because I want to recognize you. Mm -hmm. And like they just having the first women's honor flights, the twins said that when they called them about the honor flight for them to go, oh, we're not men. We don't get to go on those because all you ever saw in these honor flights are men. So I think general in the public, I think there needs to be a better visibility to us right. that what we, you know, you know, what they're doing. And I still think even with the, you know, all the media now that we have with what's going on in Afghanistan, right, you still, it's like an occasional story, you, you still don't know what the ladies did over there. Mm -hmm. You know, you still don't know that, you know, how many of them, I mean... We have a colonel that uh, was at a Wounded Warrior Weekend and, and, and she was over an IED and, you know, lost her sight and several, you know, nobody knows, it's like sure. nobody knows those stories, but you'll hear about every man that ever something happened to, and, and I, I just think that's not right. Absolutely. So, but what, <clears throat> what can we take away from this? What, what, what should we be doing now? We should be recognizing all veterans, regardless of whether they are female or male. Mm -hmm. That's the point that I would like to leave. Yeah, I think I agree with Eunice, but I also think that the military needs to step up um, and really address MST and PTSD in females and really educate everybody, males and females alike, that you know we all serve equally and that type of behavior is not and will not be tolerated whether you're an officer or whether you're enlisted.